So what's going on with Dragon? Recently this man's been trending, getting cooked for being a fraud, so what's up? What's this man planning and where's he gonna go in the future? Well to answer that, we have no choice but to go back to the beginning. Dragon, leader of the revolutionary army, was introduced in chapter 100 of the manga in Logetown, alongside a quote by Goldie Roger, inherited will, the destiny of an age, and the dreams of its people. As long as people continue to pursue the meaning of freedom, these things will never cease to be. And following that, he says, a pirate? That's fine too. This is just a great introduction, the foreshadowing of Dragon being Luffy's father, Roger's connection to freedom that gets built upon so much later, and of course Luffy's connection to liberation and freedom that we don't understand the full scope of until over 20 years after this chapter's release, and we're definitely gonna find out even more about that in the future. But besides the fantastic intro, we hardly get anything, and that pretty much sums up Dragon as a whole throughout the entire story. A lot of guesswork and theory surround him for good reason, we just don't have much, so I'll try to string together as coherent of a life story as I can for you, so with that being said, Said, let's get into Dragon's childhood. A lot of what went on here probably mirrors Luffy's childhood, Garp staunchly demanding Dragon become a marine but having a light touch overall in his parenting, which either would have fallen to Dragon's mother or if she died already which tends to happen in One Piece, someone like Dadan. Either of these don't really impact much and neither do any of Dragon's other potential childhood friends or influences since as we recently found out he did join the marines, so whatever Garp did worked. The most impact Dragon could have had in his childhood to sway him away from the world government might have been stories or even him witnessing their abuses of power first hand, which could have planted a seed in his mind that they needed to be taken down eventually or not, either way I think the main bulk of his revolutionary ideals undoubtedly came from events in his adulthood, so let's dive into that. The earliest we see him is Roger's execution, him even being there is really interesting. He has this fascination with pirates, not surprising as they're the main force in the world besides the world government itself and have a massive impact, but that only really geared up after the execution, so why was he there in the first place? I think he has a huge interest in the One Piece and everything surrounding it, and wanted to see the final final act of the man who found it. I think he definitely knows that the secrets of the Void Century and everything else are on Laugh Tale, and he's really interested in the philosophy of freedom that he shares with Roger and pirates like him, albeit not the exact same type but still freedom nonetheless, and he believes the secrets of Joy Boy are essential to freeing the world, as we the readers are led to believe as well. I think Dragon has connections with pirates too, the most likely one being Shanks. I really want it to be the case that Shanks gave him some insider info about Laugh Tale or something Roger or Odin said to help him piece things together. This would work even better with Rayleigh too. He seems like he'd be down to just have a chat with someone like Dragon who's working for a great cause, and remember Rayleigh was willing to reveal everything to Luffy and Robin when he just met them, so I don't see any reason why he wouldn't be willing to do the same for the man liberating countries all over the world from oppression, who would definitely benefit from this knowledge, and Dragon strikes me as a type that doesn't really care about the journey like that, if he can learn more he will, and that's how it should be. Stakes are higher for Dragon than they are for Luffy, the highest actually. He's the leader of the only direct opposition to the Celestial Dragons, so it would be irresponsible in my opinion if he turned down the info. The next time we see him is at Ohara after the incident, running into Vegapunk, and he straight away starts roasting this man like he doesn't hold back at all. But the reason he was there was because he knew Clover in the past, and I guess came to pay his respects. He's furious that the world government snuffed out the scholars just for questioning authority, and says he's gonna build an army to fight back against them. Vegapunk responds that he thought Dragon hated war, which is an interesting detail, and anything like this, any small piece of his personality that we get is crucial at this point to learning more about him. There are many types of revolutionaries, but two of the big ones are the ones that sow conflict and war to put themselves in a better position to take over, and then the ones that fight because that's the only option left. It's clear from this line and many other things we've seen that Dragon is very much the latter. He hates war, but the Celestial Dragons being totalitarianism incarnate leave absolutely no other option but to fight. They rule with absolute military might, and replicating that with an army of his own would be crucial to defeating them. The next we see of Dragon is in Kuma's flashback. Here we see the proper birth of the revolutionary army. Before then, as we can see, they were just known as freedom fighters, more of a loose, less organized ragtag group, but with the addition of Kuma, they changed things around. They were freeing nations one by one by training up the rebellions and adding them to their cause, and slowly built themselves up to become a worldwide organization, having branches and commanders in all four blues and the Grand Line. We hardly get anything else on his big moves during this time, so we can only look at a couple scenes to flesh out his character. He runs into Kuma when he's looking for a cure to his daughter's illness, and Dragon gives him a lead to Vegapunk, and wishes for him to rejoin the revolution since everyone wants to see him and Dragon wants him to see their progress. Sukuma so says he'll rejoin when Bonnie's cured and Dragon tells him to go where fate takes him. 
Again, Dragon's use of the word fate is essential. He truly believes in fate the same way Roger does. If he finds out or even if he already knows about Luffy's awakening, he'll believe it's fate, that his son is the reincarnation of the symbol of liberation, and this is truly the era where things can change, and that's completely right. Alright, as I've said, we only have a few scraps, so we gotta make the most out of them. So we gotta look at him saving Sabo. The sheer amounts of fury he has in this panel is immeasurable. His hate for the celestial dragons is boiling over, and this is what drives him, and he sees these things constantly. Every new island he liberates, and especially the ones he fails to, he sees countless atrocities, and the fact he gets this worked up over every single one shows his resolve and dedication and care for these people. And all this builds up to Dragon's biggest play yet, the attack on Marijoie. As Sabo tells us, this raid had three objectives. To destroy the symbol of the Celestial Dragon's power, the Hoove, thus declaring war. One Piece does this a bunch of times. Symbols mean a lot to the world government. Soga King shooting through the flag was also a declaration of war, the empty throne being a big symbol as well. These things define the world government's strength, so destroying them sends a huge message, especially in their own homeland, the center of their strength. The second objective was to free Kuma, who by this point was reduced down to a husk. I won't go too deep into this since Kuma obviously deserves his own video, but this must have been heartbreaking for Dragon. Along with that, they freed as many slaves as they could, and the final objective was to destroy their food reserves, and this was the big one. Simultaneously, while the world government was distracted by this attack, Dragon triggered uprisings in 12 nations, 8 of which succeeded, which really puts his tactical mind and intelligence on display. Sure, could he and the rest of the army have joined the raid too and probably destroyed all of Marijua? Definitely possible, and many leaders would have taken the chance, but he's in it for the long haul, freeing one nation at a time and building his power and influence, and that's what makes him so dangerous to the government. I mean, think about it, if this was Big Mom or Kaido instead, they're gonna rush straight in with their whole crew, and yeah, with their sheer firepower probably would have irreparably damaged Marijua, killing hundreds of celestial dragons. But what then? The Gorosei and God's Knights intervene, and then it's done. And if you're wondering why they didn't intervene in the first place, by the way, it was because they only seem to appear when it's the last resort. Even on Egghead, Saturn only appeared when he had no other option. They already had two admirals at the Reverie, Fujitora of course not following protocol, but still, I don't think any celestial dragons even died. And the revolutionaries' main goals involved getting in, wreaking havoc for a few hours tops, and leaving. If the attack was instead the whole army and dragon just raining down firepower, killing celestial dragons, then they'd respond with a devastating counter, and Dragon knew this. He planned it out so they did just enough damage to where the real powerhouses wouldn't need to show themselves, but enough to severely damage the celestials. Destroying their food reserves and freeing many of their slaves are huge blows to them. And remember, that was all just a bonus. Even if they just came in and declared war and failed at everything else, that would be enough to distract the government while Dragon liberated those 8 countries. This was an overwhelming strategic victory in every way, and I don't think people give Dragon enough credit for that. When Sabo returns from the reverie, we get more information on Dragon's philosophy. He's not an extreme revolutionary by any means, he shows support for monarchy, believing Cobra and monarchs like him are good, but obviously showing no support for someone like Wapple. And I think the same goes for the marines. The way I see Dragon's ideal plan playing out is taking out the celestial dragons and either splitting up the world government entirely, or reforming it with more of a light touch, more of a united nations approach to reference our world, more of an alliance than a supreme overlord that rules over everything beneath. It. And the same goes for the navy. I think he would get rid of people like Akainu with severe and authoritarian ideals for justice, but I don't think he'd have a problem with someone like Fujitora running things. Besides taking down the Celestial Dragons, Gorosei, God's Knights, and of course Emu, I see his plans as less of a revolution and more of a reformation. Dragon doesn't really seem extreme. It's more like bringing down the levels of insanity from like a 12 to like a 5. But in the eyes of the world of One Piece right now, things are so bad, it seems like this is some insane radicalism. But if we take a step back, it really isn't. Aside from Dragon, I want to see some other philosophies at play from other revolutionaries. I mean, Sabo himself is probably more quote unquote radical than Dragon, willing to take credit for Cobra's death to fuel the revolution. I want to see how far they're willing to go for this cause, and if Dragon will go all the way, or if there will be a rift in the revolution itself, because that's very much possible. A squad situation could repeat, but even scarier, because this time it could not be a trick that splits the revolution, but genuinely someone pointing out how different the philosophies of the members are, because there's such a wide margin. Those who think all monarchs should be dethroned, all the way to the ones that only think the celestial dragon should be removed. And there's many in the middle of that. Everything's fine now because they're only at the starting line in the grand scheme of things, but as they get closer to their goal, as happens in every revolution, there's gonna be those that are not satisfied, those that want to go farther and farther, or maybe I'm overthinking it. Maybe if the celestials are gone, the revolutionaries will be smart enough to take things slow, but all it takes is one, one convincing member, maybe a commander who disagrees with dragon to form a rift, and if that happens before emu is taken care of, things can backfire very quickly. So, so with everything we've seen, where do I think Dragon goes from here? I think 
think him and the revolution are in a great spot, but they can never be too careful. They were undetected for a long time on Baltigo, but after a clash with Blackbeard, it was destroyed and they had to move HQ to the Kamabaka Kingdom, which could be dangerous. I don't think they can lay low like before, especially since geographically it's close to Lelouchia, which just got nuked by Emu. And whenever that weapon recharges, if they know about Kamabaka, it could easily be the next target. This weapon is incredibly scary, unlike anything since the ancient weapons probably. It can not only destroy islands, but destroy them without a trace left. Opposed to say, a powerhouse like Whitebeard using his fruit to destroy an island. This weapon does it so efficiently, it makes it seem like it was never even there, which is of course the goal. Luckily Sabo did see this insane display firsthand and will be very adamant to Dragon about the threat it can pose, so I think the only options for Dragon are to either move HQ frequently or make his move very soon. He's kinda stuck now, backed into a corner, and it's very good that he took the Celestial's food supplies away, because he's backed them into a similar corner. But as I said, as the government is backed up more and more, they're gonna use their ultimate weapons, which they would usually try to hide, and the question is if Dragon has the same kind of hidden weapons that he can respond with. I mean, the government's been cooking so much up, even just the pacifistas were devastating. Now the Seraphims too, Dragon either needs to be unbelievably strong himself or have some major firepower to respond with. And speaking of, I should mention the Storm slash Wind Logia theory. This pretty much stems from Logetown, where a bolt of lightning saves Luffy's life, and Dragon does use the term Winds of Fate and things like that quite frequently. I think this theory is good, it would work really well and have some nice foreshadowing, and at the same time be a really powerful fruit, but would it be enough? As far as we can see, every single Gorosei has a god if not demon fruit, so can a Logia even compete at this point? Well, I think it depends on the direction that Oda goes with it. It might control all weather, which would make it like Anel's, Smoker's, potentially Ace's fruits combined, which would be insane, or it might not even be a Logia at all. Like look how versatile Big Mom's fruit is. It's completely separate from a Logia, and yet she was able to recreate Anel's fruit with Zeus pretty much perfectly, with the ability to do an infinite amount of other things too. So same deal with Dragon, he could just have a random fruit that just seems like a weather Logia that could do so much more than that. On the topic of his power, he definitely has great hockey since Sabo does, and he most likely trained him at least at first, and he's 99% confirmed to have conquerors. I mean, how could you be the son of Garp, father of Luffy, and the most wanted man alive and not? But I'm not gonna sit here and guess what his level of power is exactly, I'm not a power scaler, and even if I was, we literally have nothing to go on. So circling back to something I talked about earlier, Dragon's allies. How much military might can he bring to the table? Well from what we've seen, he's recruited people from every country he's liberated to the larger cause of the revolution, and we can assume he has at least like a Whitebeard fleet number of allies from that and his normal recruiting, but putting aside his army itself, cause that's all speculation as well, does he have non-revolutionary allies? When it comes to pirates, there's only one man really, Shang. As we know, Shanks is obsessed with Blackbeard, and since Dragon just had a war with him, it would be natural for them to be on the same side, enemy of my enemy type thing at least, if not a deeper relationship. I also mentioned in my Aokiji video that one of Dragon's goals is definitely to either get the One Piece or prevent it from falling into the wrong hands, aka Blackbeard pretty much, but people like Big Mom and Kaido before they lost too. As I've talked about, Dragon has a huge fascination with pirates. He understands their enormous impact on the world and even more how important the One Piece is, both as a symbol that every pirate chases, which in and of itself gives it immense power, but also the secrets that come along with it, and whatever the treasure itself is. If Blackbeard gets the secrets, he's not gonna stop like Roger did. The One Piece isn't his end goal like it is for Luffy. He's gonna get all the information on the ancient weapons, reawaken them, and wreak havoc on the world. You might think that's good for Dragon, Blackbeard would definitely topple the world government, but it needs to be done correctly. Dragon, as much hate as he has for the Celestials, believes in the rule of law and government, and dismantling all of it would be even worse than keeping the status quo. So in short, I think him and Shanks are at least loosely allied and would fight together against a common enemy like Blackbeard. So what's the rough game plan for Dragon? Well I think now that he's purposefully declared war and taken the Celestial's food supplies, he's gonna slowly lay siege on Marijua, as Ivankov says here, and I think this would be really smart, moving his forces closer so it's not possible for them to use the weapon without destroying Marijua itself in the process. Lay siege till Celestial Dragons start fighting among themselves, which will happen, when the God's Knights take the remaining food for themselves, which they will do, you think Charlos is gonna take that? Nah. There might even be a full blown civil war between the actual trained strong celestials and the weak ones, which obviously ends in one way, but how will that look? Morgans is gonna have an absolute field day writing about how celestials are fighting, if not killing each other. Their reputation as gods will go out the window and the gods knights will be forced to move. They'll attack dragon's forces and as strategically sound as dragon is, I think he will have a counter. As we can see, he's very cautious of the knights, but I don't think enough so that he's scared, just very careful, and with things falling in his hands as they are, I think he definitely has some counters ready. What are they? No clue. We got no info and therefore no frame of reference, the best I could possibly do is take like Karasu's fruit and all the other commander's fruits and make a theory on things they could do with those, but in the grand scheme of things, there's just so much to consider, I think that would just
just be going into imaginary land. But assuming Dragon has a counter for the God's Knights, I don't think he has a plan for the Gorosei, and definitely not Emu, since he just found out about him and the Gorosei's powers, so I think the plan will be to get his allies, notably Shanks on board to help out. That's the plan anyway, I don't think it'll go that well for them. I think either the God's Knights will overpower the Revolutionaries, or Shanks will be attacked by Blackbeard and won't be able to step in, which will lead to either the Revolutionaries losing and having to retreat, or the timing is perfect, Luffy and the boys stepping in last minute. Cause this is a story, and looking at it narratively, that's just the way it's gotta be. Though I would love if it was all Revolution versus World Government, that's just not realistic. As I said earlier, if they do succeed in bringing down the World Order, I think Dragon would want a government with a lighter touch, and more of a union system rather than an authoritarian one. He'd support the Navy since he was in the Navy, and I believe he left, not because it was inherently bad, but because it was controlled by the world government. The next step would be to root out the unjust kings and queens on a smaller scale, and that would probably take years in and of itself, going to hundreds if not thousands of islands and seeing how they're governed. But even after that, it would be a long road ahead to heal the damage the world government has done. The generational trauma of slavery and discrimination would take decades if not centuries to heal, and more importantly, maintain, and this would be a lifelong mission of dragons. So even if Luffy ends up defeating the government, dragon will play a huge role after, since obviously Luffy ain't doing all that. And it would be really interesting to see exactly what direction Dragon takes, since obviously this whole time I've just been assuming. But in conclusion, Dragon isn't extreme, he just wants the bare minimum, essentially, to be restored to the world. He believes in freedom and destiny as much as anyone in the story, and he won't hesitate to use harsh methods to accomplish his goals. He'll make tough choices, like not rescuing Ginny, which he's getting cooked for, but there was no way in hell that would have went well. In fact, she was probably partially captured as bait, in the hope Kuma, or even better, the whole army would rush Marijua while they were still in their infant and doom themselves. But Dragon is laser focused, he's seen the worst of what this world is, but he truly believes this is the era it can be changed, and he believes he's the man to change the world. So there it is, if you watch till the end, you probably want to subscribe to see at least one or two more of my videos, right? But yeah, besides that, peace out.